and I also had um, the Domestic Abuse Research Network, which I set up in 2019 um, with the support of actually Suffolk County Council and um, the Office of Police and Crime Commissioner in Norfolk. And the whole idea is to bring people together, to bring academics, practitioners, anyone interested in tackling domestic abuse and related areas in order to actually find solutions. So this really fits really closely to that remit of having the right conversations. And today's just all of this about having those conversations. Um, so welcome to, you know, to, for you joining the space, but also in terms of engaging with us, with this space as well. You know, today is about listening, today is about learning from really experienced, knowledgeable speakers. And what even is more brilliant is that they're all men. You know, and part of this is because we believe that it is time for men to speak out, it is time for men to step up. Um, and actually, there is room for us to actually um, listen to men in terms of finding a way forward, in which is driven by men, not necessarily only by the labor of women, um, who are obviously always concerned about violence against, um, against women and girls um, as well. So I'm going to, um, with that said, I'm going to pass down to Suzanne, who is going to just introduce herself and say a little bit about Save Lives Involvement. Um, and then I will you know, talk a little bit about the format for today's event, um, and then we'll pass it on to our lovely speakers today. Over to you, Suzanne. I'm really, really happy to be here. I am sorry to be filling in for Mina because I don't want to hear that she's unwell, um, and I hope she gets better really soon, but very excited and a bit nervous frankly, to be here. I can see we're nearly 400 people on the session already, which is amazing. You're all really, really welcome. Um, and I know you've probably all turned down like an hour's chat outside the pub about whether Jurgen Klopp is gonna like join the Super League or whatever. So really, really happy that you're here with us instead. Um, not least with the sun shining outside, this is a great evening to be talking about um, how men and boys get engaged in this conversation. We hope it's gonna be a really open conversation, a really respectful conversation. Um, none of us quite knows what's gonna come from it, but I think that's okay. Um, in terms of safe lives as an organization, uh, some of you will know us well. We're a domestic abuse charity that operates all across the UK and our mission is to end domestic abuse for everyone and for good. Um, we started thinking and working on the idea of men and boys voices a few years ago on the basis that you know, we cannot have this conversation, just women in a room uh, by ourselves. Um, you know, we're only gonna get to the bottom of this problem if we're totally inclusive about who's part of this conversation. Um, and so we opened that up and were really surprised and really pleased to find that over 1200 men and boys took part in a first piece of engagement work that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and a lot of people were saying, nobody's ever talked to us about this stuff before. Nobody's been having this conversation with us. So we felt encouraged by that. We felt like maybe there was a space to kind of keep the conversation going and really, really pleased to, to support this event with Aluma Day and Mina this evening and all of you um, to take that conversation forward. We've got amazing speakers um, this evening and uh, brilliant men and women kind of joining the session. Uh, I hope that you all go away feeling that there's something practical that you can do. And we're just going to test that a little bit at the end of the session through a really brief little interactive bit called Mentimeter. None of it will be public. None of it will be on screens. It's all anonymous, but just a really quick way of just taking a temperature check, I guess, about what you've heard and how you feel about it um, and how you feel about it going forward. So uh, thank you for being here really excited for the event. I'll be back in uh, a little bit later on um, to do the Q&A and to, uh, to close us out with the mentee and uh, yeah, and next steps. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That's really wonderful introduction and wonderful welcome. Um, and like just to talk about the format for today's event. So we've sort of gone with a sort of TED talk style, which we hope will be not only interesting, but would also mean that we can actually be quite snappy about our running order. And all of the speakers have been briefed, so they're just going to follow each other one after the other and um so don't you know don't be too surprised but if you've ever been in a ted talk we actually think that that's actually very impactful because obviously it means that it gives every speaker the chance to share their big idea to actually talk about with their own voice what they think is very important and what needs to be happening um in terms of changing the narrative but also in terms of creating those paradigm shifts that we know that are necessary for us to bring about change 
Um, I think for me, one of the things I was I'm just going to leave and say that we know that it's very important that collectively and individually that the that men recognize the forces that um, lead to the killing of women um, by men. I mean, the tragic murder of Sarah Everard um, and Nicole um, Nicole and Biba Smallman is you know it's very much at the back of our minds. Um, these are very sad, sad um, cases and sad situations, and actually. You know, even though obviously we know that we're providing space, is also to say that you know this is something that everyone, I would imagine, many people, including myself, feel very strongly about. That we really need to tackle violence against women and girls. We really need to bring an end to it, and we cannot do it on our own. We cannot. Oh, not. It is not only a women's issue. It really is a, a men's men's issue, but also a societal issue. So today is really all about providing that space. So I'm really excited to have. There's wonderful speakers who will be able to speak to the issue even much more than Susanna and I could ever talk about these issues. And um, I think there's something very powerful about um, this, you know, the issues being spoken about from a men's, a male perspective and about men. And I think, you know, we have, I think about 200 men on this call. And, and I think it's really exciting to see what ripple effects can actually come out of this, of today's event. So we're really excited and we're really glad that you've taken time from you know, lovely weathered sunshine. I've got loads of sunshine here as well in Suffolk, um, but it's really nice to be all in space with you all today. And with that said, I think it's really um, at that time to actually pass on to Professor David Gad, who would then begin the introductions. They've got 20 seconds each to really introduce themselves, and then we'll get to the meat of the event for today as well. Okay, over to you, David. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to speak tonight. It's uh, so wonderful to see so many people attending and I'm really honoured to be able to share some thoughts with you. Um, we have some serious problems to attend to though. One in 13 women in the UK experience domestic abuse each year. One in five have been sexually assaulted as adults and so few of those secure anything that looks like justice. My view is that this won't change unless we reduce the volume of gender-based abuse and reducing the volume of gender-based abuse will require us to engage with the emotional attractions of violence and control to men. To be clear, I'm not giving credence to the crime of passion defence. I'm just as unconvinced, I'm sure most of you are, by the argument that some men kill their partners because they just snapped. But I do think we need to ask how it can seem reasonable for a man to physically punish his partner for being unable to curtail events outside of her control or for simply speaking her mind. And we need to ask what this reveals about the emotional work men expect women to do for them in intimate relationships. What kinds of complex emotional labor is performed for men who purport to be in control before they lose control? Why do some men who are abusive seem to need their families much, me much more than their families, children and partners need them? The answer we give to this usually to this question is misogyny or everyday sexism, which is right. But if we're going to respond effectively to those who've aligned themselves with the not all men hashtag, then we do have to ask why some men and not others become so invested in misogyny. What do they get from it? Well, older men are actually much more likely to endorse the more traditional patriarchal values than younger men. But rates of domestic abuse perpetration are higher amongst younger men, the group aged 15 to 25, many of whom would say that they support gender equality. My own research has shown that most young men, in fact, know that it's wrong to hit a partner, but some do evoke exceptions to this rule, typically when a partner has hit them first or when they suspect a partner has cheated on them. Most young men can understand how their own fears of betrayal generate controlling behaviour, which they construe as justifiable in some circumstances, even if they generally regard it as morally wrong. And such controlling behaviour inevitably often generates arguments in couples, which some men construe as fights which they then presume they must always win. For me, this means we need to direct our attention to the contradictions in many men's attitudes towards domestic abuse and their willingness to excuse in particular instances of violence, that which they would ordinarily condemn in the abstract. Most young men, and I would say quite a few older men, struggle to realize, to understand that controlling a partner actually increases their own feelings of insecurity in an intimate relationship. And some young men do have more reasons than others to struggle with trust. Those who've been serially let down by parents and professionals who have lived in institutional care or been in prison as children uh, have reason to be dis distrusting. And some of those young men do come to invest in tough, I can look after myself variants of masculinity, which simultaneously render them both more prone to violence 
and more inclined to see themselves as nothing like the crazy madmen or racialized stereotypes of perpetrators that most attract media coverage. What can we do about this? Well, I want to suggest there are three things. First, we've come a really long way with preventative education in schools, but we're still mi missing some key parts of an effective strategy there. Most of our service provision is directed at adults, not teenagers, and most of our education stops at 16, when, as everyone invited is now reminding us, it needs to continue way into adulthood. Second, how we engage with young men really matters. Nowadays, most young people leave school knowing the different types of abuse, that it affects women most, but that some men are victims too. They spot, however, that PHSE is a non-examined subject. They spot also the tokenism when an LGBT vignette is thrown in, thrown in after a couple of weeks on pregnancy. And if they are a young man living with a father who is abusive, they spot the problem with the violence against women and girls agenda that limits the degree to which they can legitimately identify with their mothers and sisters as victims of male violence and which raises the suspicion that they may be as dangerous as their dads or stepdads. So we have a system in which many young men wrote, learn facts about domestic abuse, but which I think fails to interrogate with them the push and pulls of intimacy or how it feels to be fearful or to recognize that with intimacy comes vulnerability and a need to relinquish some control. We teach kids to ask for consent and that porn is bad, but we don't explore with young men what desire or enthusiasm might look like in their partners or teach them to check out at a deeper level what their partners might want from a relationship. We can change this, but it will mean abandoning the macho discourse of teaching bad men a lesson echoed in too many political responses, left and right, to the tragedy of femicide and sexual violence. What we need is proactive public engagement, not just public awareness campaigns, in which children and their teachers grandfathers, fathers and sons, brothers and sisters, boyfriends and girlfriends can collectively acknowledge the emotional needs many men covet away by controlling their partners and by abusing women and children. This conversation, I conclude, needs to expose the emasculating weaknesses violence and abuse routinely conceal as much as the power their enactment routinely entails. Thank you for listening to what I have had to say. Rather than delay further, I'm going to hand over to Darren Lavelle, who I believe is based in the West Midlands and is CEO of the Epiphany People Project. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> so yes, I'm uh, Darren Lavelle, uh, founder of the Epiphany People. Um, we work and support families impacted by youth violence and, um, and trauma. And um, it's actually in our work that we've found that um, many of the victims of um, criminal exploitation as an early childhood experience may have experienced, um, as adverse childhood experience, they may have experienced um, domestic abuse within the household. So um, that's what brings us here. To, that's what brings me here today. So firstly, um, and collectively um, as men, uh, we need to see this as not um, women's problems. It needs to be seen as our problem and not something that we detach from. Um, obviously, there's, you know, we often spoke about, um, you know, the patriarchal society that we live in. Um, but what ultimately that does is creates the lack of introspection and accountability that often goes way beyond what's more commonly spoken about of um, male privilege. So this often goes unexamined. Gender violence prevention. Um, basically, as men, we need to mobilize. We need to reach into spaces where men populate and have frank, open, difficult and op uh, conversations around violence um, towards women, against women, um, and these spaces must include all spaces, be it personal, professional, political, and intellectual. The reality is, is that women have built this movement that we're speaking out against, right? But what I'm saying is now it's time for us men to actually step up and, and step out and be seen for doing that, all right? But ultimately, in terms of in these spaces where 
where men usually populate and will be uh, where these discussions need to take place, we need to be prepared to, to, to tackle the victim blaming culture amongst men. What so narratives such as why does she go for some, this type of men, considering what she may have been wearing, why didn't she consider her safeties, or uh, as we know, victim blaming language, um, all of this takes away the emphasis from men. And as I've as I've gone on to find out on my journey, um, is actually a lot of the time the language that is used is is very much all around victim blaming and always takes away the accountability and the responsibility of men. This is deeply ingrained for me in, in every fabric of society, from our policies, from the court processes, from, from the press, from to music, pornography, and spaces where men populate and are in positions of power. In these spaces, the conversation should be more around why are men violent towards women? We should have questions like, why is domestic abuse still a global issue? Should be having discussions like, why do men physically and emotionally abuse women that they claim they love? What is going on with the men? Questions like, is violence towards women systemic? Questions like, what is the role of institutions and faith-based groups? Um, what, you know, in, what role do they play in creating abusive men? Questions like, what is the role of sport and culture? What is the role of the family structure? What is the role of the economic structure? And how does this all intersect? How can we change socialization of boys how can we change the definition of manhood we need to ensure that men challenge other men who try to mute speak over detract from the real issue by labeling women as um being misandrinist i can never say that word excuse me dyslexia <laughs> um and then you know we'll we, you know men will be quick to say male bashers bitter feminists um and and, and, and like, you know, quite rightly, like, um, you know, David mentioned about, you know, the hashtag not all men. Again, detracting from what the real issue is. This is not a gender battle. Yeah, this is a gen, this is a battle against gender based violence. So for me, what I'm looking at really um, the male bystander approach and, you know, the, uh, you know as, as I labeled it, Depatriating society, again, dyslexia kicking in. <laughs> the by, a bystander is someone who's ultimately not a perpetrator, not a victim, but they're just there. They, they can see what's going on, but they're silent. But what? But we need to ask more questions again. How do we? How do we as men get to that position where we can speak up? Again, another question, how do we challenge our friends? Again, how do we support our friends? How do men who are in non-abusive, who are non-abusive um, challenge men who are abusive? We ask questions like, is silence really consent? How do we respond when we are challenged by other men? Perhaps we need to have pre-framed responses ready to, to address these issues. And what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. These are, for me, a whole lot of questions that we need to be asking in these spaces. So I do believe I am out of time and thank you very much. And I'll pass you on to Michael. Thanks, Darren. I really enjoyed that. Those questions are absolutely fundamental. Um, uh, my name is Michael Conroy. I set up uh, an organisation called Men at Work uh, to be a framework for having challenging and meaningful conversations with uh, boys and young men in high schools or youth settings, anywhere where where young men are. Those spaces that Darren talked about, about getting into those spaces with a, a structured um 
programme for teachers, youth workers, uh, foster parents, whoever it might be uh, in a mentoring role, somebody who can have a sustained dialogue uh, with boys and young men as they develop and as the, the social and cultural values by which they are bombarded um, are digested by them, are sort of are interrogated by boys and young men or are uh, enacted by them. So the programme that I've set up, 10 Dialogues, it's, it's simple in a sense and that is intended to contribute to a whole network and constellation of violence reduction programmes and initiatives. Um, but simple things sometimes can be really difficult to, to just take the first step. But I know that lots of schools, lots of youth settings are asking themselves, what can we do? You know, what is it we can do practically to address the uh, emergence of sexism, the emergence of misogyny in, in boys and young men? Um, and I, I try to make a contribution to that as simple, really. I, you know, as, as we all do, we do what we can in the spaces that we inhabit and that we have access to. Um, really good points, uh, both from David and Darren. I'm just really pleased to be here tonight with the, with the other speakers, and I look forward to the questions and answers. Um, really important, just kind of, I, I did have a prepared thing. It, it's it's melted, my brain's like that. I will not run over time, no, I promise. But just to say that... Um, the question of consent is something that keeps coming back to me, uh, and I think we do need to look primarily at the question of entitlement, because as David alluded to, the idea that people know the facts, young men know the facts about PSAG, about consent, um, that intellectual understanding of a situation is very different to the emotional one and, and, and the action of the young man or boy in, in a given situation. So. The, the programs that I do are really prior to consent. They are about uh, how we as boys and young men, uh, me as an old man maybe now, um, are trained or collectively socialized by the messages that we, we gather from family, friends, religion, uh, politicians, books, films, whatever it is, all the things that transmit messages, how they transmit um, uh, messages that's, that are part of patriarchal culture is just just simple as that. I don't really, um, I, I can't really entertain any any suggestions otherwise because you know uh, our cultures for millennia have been male centric and male dominated, and that's that's where we still are now. Um, so the idea is that we just try and help young boys uh, and men develop critical thinking skills, empathy. Uh, and to walk through all kinds of situations before they find themselves in them and, and to explore their responses, their reactions, and then explore again just by just constantly asking questions. Why? Why? Where does that come from? Who told you that? Why do, you, why do we think that? So it's not accusatory in any sense. Um, uh, and it is collaborative and respectful, which I think is the way forward to work with boys and young men. I uh, never, it's not, if we approach it as a kind of hypodermic transmission of, um, you know, superior um, morality from an adult to a boy, then I think we, we're kidding ourselves. Uh, any meaningful work really has to be uncomfortable for the facilitator as well, because we have to look at ourselves and look at the men we've been and look at the relationships we've had. Um, and that I think is where change can come from. Um, but as Darren suggested earlier as well, the, the legal, the judicial, it has to be part of a holistic campaign. So the idea that dozens, hundreds of men, thousands of men could join to, to cover all the bases, you know, the, the early years the teaching primary, secondary, prison work, probation, um, counseling, campaigning, it all needs doing and as Darren said again women have done it all they've done it all that you know feminism has has tried to call a halt to the absolute uh, horrors of patriarchal uh, dominance of the female sex by the male sex um, and we need to step up we need to do it it's not become involved we are involved we are absolutely involved but we need to be aware of our involvement I think that's a task um, to take to the to to as young 
boys and men as possible. Uh, I won't I won't go overboard uh, in time, but I'm very excited to be here and I I want to connect and network with other men who do similar things. So my pleasure to hand over to David Challen, a great campaigner. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yes, my name is David Challen. I'm a domestic abuse campaigner. I am uh, the younger son, Sally Challen, who won her appeal to uh, of conviction of murder in February 2019 for the uh, killing of my father. Reviewing her case uh, helped um, show her life in the context of coerced control and her lived experiences and was considered a landmark case in raising awareness of coerced control. And since then, I've wanted to always speak out and, and create awareness of a lesson and form of abuse, as well as uh, men's violence against women and recognising the gendered nature of uh, the abuse. And that's why we're here today. I think uh, as men, we must start engaging in action to stop men's violence against women. It must be a commitment from all of us to, to learn and educate ourselves and one another through our own work, our own research, off our own backs, and to ask what roles we can actively take in, in confronting male violence. You know, being committed to, to listening to the women in our lives who consent, who consent to share their lived experiences. We don't have a right to ask, but it's, uh, and there should be an empathy to understand uh, the women uh, in our lives and uh, their lived experiences um, living in a fear of male violence. And um, it's really recognising and looking beyond our own experiences or our lived lives and instead actively recognising and understand the day to day threat of women uh, live and endure and question why almost every woman has an experience of sexual assault. You know, 97% of women aged between 18 and 24 have been sexually harassed in the UK. Have we ever witnessed this? A lot of us will have. What have we done? How many girls and young women have suffered because of this man or uh, these men's actions? Why have we not acted? Do we accept? Why do we accept these abusive men are part of society? What does that say about our own empathy and that we don't share the anger uh, that every other woman has um, long had well before Sarah Everard? These are questions we should be confronting. And um, kind of the action points that I could really think of is engaging the men in our lives immediately, straight off the bat, our social circles, the family, work colleagues, sexist comments, rape jokes, controlling behaviour of, of their partners. We've all had a, a, a little scope of that or seen that, you know, is that just a rabbit hole to abuse or more misogynistic views? Victim blaming, you know, why is this funny? Really deconstructing uh, those arguments in our groups and confronting um, it because there's an... For however many sexual assaults and violence are against women, there's an infinite amount of misogynistic views that are held and espoused in conversations online in person that, like I said, just now are an absolute uh, rabbit hole to, to how much abuse that might manifest and be carried out by uh, younger men when not even confronted at an early age. And you know, if that allows to be continued, you know, anger against women that might come to uh, you know, violence and control the acts to, to maybe even the death of a woman. And these are things that, uh, that need to be uh, not allowed to go unchecked, you know, that might manifest later on in life. But it's really confronting and recognising women's experiences uh, that are imprinted with fear from a very early young age. But it's about supporting women's voices and experience as well. You know, action isn't just about speaking out ourselves, it's about listening and sharing the voices of women who have the bravery we should have most to share their own experiences and giving space and time to those women's lived experiences and showing that it matters to us, um, you know, asking what we can do to help support them, uh, but giving them the floor first because it is about their experiences, but it's about getting engaged and getting engaged is much about being politically active. You know, if you do care about these issues, you can't just confront it in your own social circles about what is society doing to confront this. Domestic abuse is everyone's business. You know, speaking about this myself, I've mostly walked into uh, rooms filled with women confronting this issue, and it feels very sobering as a, as a, a man uh, to, um, you know, to be said, you know, it's great what you're doing, not many men speak out, it's quite an embarrassing thing, but, you know, men need to get more actively involved and there's a lot of support and change that's happened now with the domestic abuse bill. Why is that on, that on men's agenda? You know, no serial per, uh, register for serial perpetrators, no register for serial perpetrators. That's outrageous. Why do women not support the domestic abuse? That's outrageous. You know, equality and recognising uh, these values and, and, and standing up for women. Many men stood outside court with me for my mother 
Uh, and they're a part of that change. And many men can be part of that change in the future. But it's about caring enough and being, uh, you know, broadening your awareness of, of the news you, that you take in and the empathy of the women's experiences and just engaging. Because if you care enough, you will care enough and you will find something that you can do. There's many things like the decriminalization of rape that we should all be outraged about and can get outside courts when we can and uh, stand there and have the same amount of anger and support women's voices. Um, so, yeah, that's that's um, how I feel about it. But I have a real pleasure to pass on to Stephen Burrow, who I'm really excited to hear about. Um, so thanks. On to you, Stephen. Thanks so much, David. And um, yeah, uh, so my name is Stephen Burrell. I'm a researcher at uh, Durham University in the Centre for Research into Violence and Abuse. And I'm, uh, as with all the other speakers, just really um, privileged to be here, really. Um, so the thing I wanted to talk about was um, something which I think is kind of one of the the uh, kind of important things which all men can can do to kind of play a role in, in helping to end uh, men's violence against women, um, which is to kind of reflect on and shift our own kind of complicity in the problem, really. Um, and so um, when I when I say complicity, I mean kind of that's more than just kind of um, never perpetrating any form of violence and abuse, um, or even uh, simply speaking out about it, which is of course absolutely vital um, but it also means examining I suppose the kind of multiple ways in which our lives are implicated in gender inequality and working to change that uh, because we know that gender inequality provides the foundations upon which men's violence against women is built um, so that includes a lot of the things which other speakers have already mentioned things like challenging the kind of sexist and misogynistic attitudes and behaviors which we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives uh, such as the kind of routine objectification of women and girls, um, for example, in our friendship groups, in our family, in our families, um, with colleagues at work, and indeed, you know, in ourselves and our own kind of minds as well. Um, and it means addressing the inequalities which may exist in our own uh, relationships. You know, for example, asking who is it that's doing the kind of childcare and housework in, in my relationship? Um, and, and I suppose also looking to the different spaces in which we kind of live our lives, for example, the workplace. Um, you know, how, what can we do to make those spaces that we're a part of more equal and more inclusive? Um, and it also means reflecting on the ways in which we might be influenced by kind of patriarchal ideas and norms, which run through, uh, you know, different aspects of our society and culture, um, such as how kind of men continue to dominate spaces such as politics and religion and sport, uh, or how men's stories and perspectives still tend to be treated as the kind of default in our culture, uh, or how pornography is so pervasive and, and impacts more broadly as well on different aspects of, of our media in society. Uh, but perhaps most importantly of all for me, it, it means working to change what it means to be a man in society. Um, and in this respect, I think, you know, what we do is as important as what we say, really, uh, you know, in terms of kind of modeling healthier, kind of egalitarian, caring behaviors to, the, to other men and boys around us and kind of pushing back on the kind of rigid and restrictive ideas of masculinity that we kind of often pressure each other to conform to. And of course, you know, these conversations and reflections can be uncomfortable uh, at times um, because, you know, as feminists have, have told us for time immemorial, um, this is something, this is a topic which is deeply personal for all of us. Um, and, you know, gender inequality affects the lives of all men, often in ways which we don't even think about or which might seem or are kind of presented as being kind of entirely natural and normal. Um, and all of us have probably at times, you know, either consciously or unconsciously helped to keep that in place, uh, such as by staying silent about things like everyday acts of sexism and misogyny and, of course, uh, men's violence against women in society. Uh, but really, I, you know, I don't think we can make progress without having some of these uncomfortable conversations, because ultimately we are talking about shifting, uh, you know, unequal distributions of power in our society fundamentally. So, for example, I think one important thing for men to reflect on if we want to help challenge men's violence against women is how, how can we do that in ways which are supportive of uh, and accountable to and respectful of the kind of decades of work that the women's movement has been doing on this. So, you know, we need to make sure we're not kind of reproducing gender inequalities or kind of harmful masculine norms uh, within spaces to tackle these very issues, you know, for example, by taking over the conversation or kind of seeking kind of extensive praise for doing quite small things or taking credit for things which women have actually been, you know, already saying for a very long time. And of course, you know, this is a lifelong kind of ongoing process for all of us. It's something which we all have to continually work on. 
Um, and there are, you know, there are always kind of new things for us to learn and, and ways to become better allies if, if we are actually, you know, making the effort to actively listen to women and girls and to really kind of genuinely hear the kind of multitude of ways in which their lives and freedoms are constrained by, by patriarchy. Um, but I think as well, you know, the fact that this connects to all of our lives as men also means that each of us has a vital positive role to play every day uh, in creating change, um, you know, in ourselves, among our peers and in wider society towards one in which gender equality, uh, you know, can be realized. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately that is what is necessary uh, if we're going to end men's violence against women. So thank you very much for listening. Now it's uh, my turn to pass along to Imran Manzoor, who's the head of uh, service at Breaking the Silence. Uh, over to you, Imran, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Can everybody hear me? Uh, Stephen, sorry, can everybody hear me? And uh, hopefully everybody can understand my accent. Um, I want to start with something that I came across on the internet. Um, it was by someone called Harriet Johnson. I hope to God she's not some right-wing member of the Ku Klux Klan, but she wrote, every woman you know has taken a longer route, has doubled back on herself, has pretended to dawdle by a shop window, has held her keys in her hand, has made a fake phone call, has rounded a corner and run. Every woman you know has walked home scared. Every woman you know. The project of modernity on a global scale of emancipation and individualism or this neoliberal idea of individualism by which let's be real this is what i'm talking about get rich or die trying the whole idea of get rich or die trying is something we're told can be fulfilled often rewardingly by men and by women but it's also unfil unfulfillable for many and it leads to rage and resentment for some men who can't find positions of dignity for themselves they come to loathe and hate women, feminism, and more importantly, well, or equally as importantly rather, members of racial and ethnic minorities who seem to be getting ahead of them. So I wanna to speak to the men of my community. I urge you to reflect on the meaning of adopting and using hashtags like not all men, or any of its attendant attempts at rationale for the violence against women and girls. Our enemies are not women. Just consider the rage you feel when you see white nationalists desecrate a vigil for Duante Wright, or even the so-called counter protest to the Black Lives Matter movement, where they use the slur, all lives matter. We know exactly what they mean when they use terms like that. We know not all men and all lives matter stem from the same supremacist route. Almost 63% of our service users, I forgot to mention, we work with male survivors of sexual abuse, black and South Asian, uh, predominantly black, West African, Caribbean. Almost 63% of our service users witness domestic violence. The fear of retribution that could be enacted on their mothers is what kept them silent in their childhood. Now, because of a historic tradition in my particular culture of protecting wealth through the binding of clans, we see young women brought to the UK as um, transnational spouses. In some cases, these young women lack the protection of their own family and they're subjected to horrendous acts of violence, perpetrated often by multiple members of the same household. Now, men won't talk about childhood sexual abuse and trauma, but some men will go out of their way to boast about domestic violence as some kind of bizarre demonstration of their masculinity. So childhood sexual experiences command the utmost secrecy in the name of family honor and respect. But the other seems to be upheld by the very same structures. De-individuation, which is an idea in social psychology that some would say is slightly discredited now, but it diffuses the sense of individual responsibility in the people who are doing it by reducing their inhibitions. It gives them anonymity. So I can't be find out, found out. The police are never gonna get involved here. It's not gonna happen. So let's take her passport, let's deny her freedoms. Number two, diffused responsibility. We all did it, so I'm not responsible for my actions. Everybody was doing it, I just kind of went along with everybody. And then of course, group size. And the larger the group size, the more it increases the two previous factors. We've all been party to these boasts of men who perpetrate this violence from childhood, we have. 
but we've remained silent or we've laughed the most awkward of laughs, even when in our hearts, we knew that it was wrong. It's not enough just to ostracize the perpetrator and call him a knobhead. We have to call these people out. We have to tell them what they are and tell them that it won't be tolerated. And we have to support women to get those men out of the house. Isn't that also honor? I'm gonna end by just saying one thing, and that's to the authorities. Systemic and structural inequalities facilitate violence against women and girls. Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, whatever term we want to use this week, victims know the potential consequences of allowing agents of the state, of the state sanctioned to use violence to A, abuse the victim further, and to B, cause harm that outweighs the benefit of the intervention. The victim doesn't have time to ascertain if the officer is a good apple. He may or she may be a very good person. All the victim knows is that they have a badge and that's the only way she can relate to him or her because a cop is a cop. And we do not have trust in your institutions and it is increasing violence against women and girls. It's increasing violence against children. It's increasing the likelihood of childhood traumatic experiences like sexual abuse. Discrimination is traumatizing. No one wants to go through more trauma. I'll now shut up and hand over to Darshem. Thanks Imran, uh, incredible. Um, hi everyone, I'm Darshem Sangrachka. I'm the co-founder of Being Mankind. Uh, we are a project that uses stories to uh, tackle gender stereotypes. Um, we're coming up from the angle of, as Emmanuel speaks when he wrote the poem for us, said, who knew man up could weigh a man down? Um, we feel that gender stereotypes often uh, stop someone from being who they are. They always do, but often they don't understand it at the time. So what we started to do was look at positive stories from male role models, um, people that were born uh, um, as as boys um, and start telling their stories and start showing that there are moments in life where you will have to tackle that gender stereotype, that expectation that's put on to, onto you and say, look, I'm stepping out of this. I'm stepping out of what you think I should be doing and doing what I should be doing myself. Um, and through these stories, we hope that they, they will trigger empathy and people will start seeing um, that there is a better way of doing these things. I mean, we, you know, this, someone in the comments wrote, you know, they were at a workshop 40 years ago where the same conversation was happening and nothing shifted. Um, and we've got to do something about it now. We can sort of ask people to behave in a certain way or we can inspire them to think in a different way. And that's what we do with these stories. And they're from people from all diverse backgrounds. Um, and what we do with them is that we take them into schools and we have a free educational program. Um, and through a, through a program that teachers can just plug and play um, and currently there's hundreds of schools up and down the country who have our books um, for every book you buy we give one away to the school um, and it funds our educational program so that's all free it goes to the school um, and so we've you know we've had we've had uh, kids from the age of seven plus take these programs and we've seen um, that it can make a difference um, especially at the formative years like you know we once had a teacher text us to say that um, her the program that she'd put together uh, started using of ours was working so well that um that she was really really happy but actually she was texting us because one of her nine-year-olds um had effectively been put into detention because he told a deputy head teacher to stop being sexist um because the deputy head teacher had um sort of said to some girls that they when they grow up they could be great hairdressers and great makeup artists and stuff like that and it was through the program that he was starting to understand that actually who he was, because that's what we want to do. Uh, who knew man up, could weigh away, uh, man up could weigh a man down is get rid of terms like that and start getting boys to understand who they are, who people around them are. And through these stories, start to explore topics that we just never get, uh, give chance, um, give kids a chance to explore at a young age. And if we can change that, incredible things can happen. Um, and 
that happens right from the beginning, whether, you know, you've got a child who's seeing things at, at home. Um, how does that child navigate life? What, what are the norms that they fit within, that they work within? Now they hear these stories and these things, and those stories create empathy, and those empathy creates exploration of thought. Those exploration of thought create conversations. They create relationships. They, they create much better conversations at an earlier age, and that's what we've seen happen, and not just at school. We've seen that happen uh, with adults uh, in companies that have used our stories, etc. Instead of having, um, because they've seen that men don't turn up to uh, gender diversity events and stuff. So they're like, okay, well, you know, and sometimes, and I always sort of talk about um, having to, you know, <laughs> not anymore, but having to pretend to like football. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not really a massive fan, but I, you know, sometimes you're kind of forced to be like, how was the big game? Yeah, it was great. Um, really, really good. Um, and then you're just sort of like Googling things to talk about. You don't need to do that. Um, so our work isn't about preaching of how to behave. It's literally saying there are role models everywhere, but those role models never get talked about. So kids never seen them. If we can find them, tell their stories, give them a stage, give them a platform, connect with young people and people of all ages through those stories, then you end up with empathy flowing right through. And it goes back to some of the other speakers. Like, How do we deal with this? How do we talk about it? How as a bystander do you intervene? How do you have the courage to know yourself enough to step up and say something? All those things require us to strengthen uh, kids into being humans and not boys and girls and so on and so forth. It's just be yourself, be a human. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. So as I said, go and explore our work on beingmankind.org. Um, our educational program is free on there. Um, and as I said, for every book you buy, we give one away to a school. If you use the code thank, uh, thank you or safe lives, you get some money off as well. Um, but please do read our stories because they do help people think things through in ways that they never get a chance to because we are mainly the sum of the people around us. And if there's not enough people around us that are different and diverse, we can't explore things. So please do share the stories. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass it on to uh, James Rowlands now. Thanks, that, that was great. Um, hi, my name is James Rowlands. Um, uh, I am a, a researcher at Sussex University where I'm doing a PhD looking at domestic homicide reviews. And I also chair domestic homicide reviews. And that's what I want to talk about really in men's um, status in them. Um, so for people who don't know, domestic homicide reviews are conducted after someone has been killed. Um, or has died by suicide and it's domestic violence related and and obviously in the majority of those cases that those are women who are killed or have experienced domestic abuse by men and what i want to talk about really is the absence of men often paradoxically in domestic homicide abuse and just reflect on that briefly um, i guess in starting doing that i want to acknowledge my debts a lot of what i'm going to be saying is not something i've come up about it's based on the work of activists campaigners mostly women often feminist and of course the women who have lost their lives um, to domestic homicide as a result of men's um, violence and I think what's really interesting in domestic homicide reviews and really troubling is this paradox that although um, men usually, although not exclusively, are the cause of that death, they're often quite um, invisible. They almost have this invisible status. Um, and it's very curious because they've caused the homicide, um, really. But somehow when we do domestic homicide reviews, we often, or, uh, and certainly when we talk about them, um, we often lose focus um, on men. Um, specifically. Um, we often uh, end up talking about them as individuals in a way that doesn't context contextualize their violence and abuse, doesn't link it to wider society and how uh, that is understood in terms of men's violence. So for example, we often think of male perpetrators as either mad or bad, and we don't think about them um, as being one example of men's violence um, and abuse. And we often end up actually focusing on women. We often focus on the vi victim of that homicide and make them kind of responsible for men's behavior or perhaps the things that they did or didn't do, um, which are seen as somehow the cause of what happened um, to them. And I think that's really problematic that we lose track of men in a lot of these um, things. And in DHRs, we go on to publish them and they may make really important recommendations about policy and procedure change or training, but often we don't link that to gender and how gender is working in our society and how men's 
violence um, is, is working. And we also often don't talk about how men came to use violence and abuse in the first place, which is what some of the other speakers have talked about. How is it those men who've gone on to kill their partner um, or, or whose acts have led their partner to die by suicide, how did they come to the place where they thought violence and abuse was acceptable? How come they came to the place where their friends and families weren't um, calling out what they um, did? And I think we need to interrogate that more if we're really going to understand and really have a conversation about men's violence against women um, and girls. Um, and the other reflection I want to make is, of course, I chair domestic homicide reviews and I'm a man. And I think that's something some other people have touched on, too, is I think we need to think about what we are doing as men in this field. Um, uh, what I think um, Stephen talked about how we can be complicit in male violence or certainly in gender norms, whether we want to or not. And the reality is we often benefit from um, those, um, again, whether we want to or not. So what is it that we have to do um, to be a good ally? Um, how do we need to think about how we conduct ourselves and work in those um, spaces? And I guess I want to kind of end um, with a reflection and ask, why is it so easy for us to forget that men are responsible for this violence? Why is it really easy for us to lose the big picture of men's violence and just focus on that one violent man who we describe as mad or bad? And it's because it's easier. And it also is because it hurts. It hurts to talk about men's violence and abuse because it means we need to stop and think about where we are within that and the people we love are within that. Um, and that's something which is really challenging and something that we need to think about and why men have to be part of the conversation as much um, as women. So I guess my question really is how do we keep the focus on men's um, violence? How do we keep that both individually but also systematically and systemically? Um, and how do we do that in a way where we are a good ally? So how are we in that space? What work can we do? What work should we be doing and how do we uh, do that as a good um, ally? And I guess I want to um, end with a quote by um, Bell Hooks who talked about um, at this idea of active um, uh, struggle. So it's about taking our share of the work um, and not speaking over um, women, but assuming responsibility for transforming our consciousness and as well the consciousness um, of society. Uh, so on that note, um, I think I'm at five minutes, or at least my alarm's just gone off. So um, I'm going to hand over to Duncan Craig, who's the CEO of Survivors Manchester um, and co-founder of the Male Survivors Partnership and the Men and Boys Coalition. Um, thanks, James. Um, really kind of caught me off guard. <laughs> I, was, I was just too busy reading what everybody else was saying. Um, so my name is Duncan Craig, I'm the um, Chief Executive of uh, Survivors Manchester, an organisation supporting boys and men who were affected by sexual abuse, rape and sexual exploitation. Um, in being part of this panel discussion, um, I was asked to think about one clear message or idea that you would like to share to help stop men's violence against women and girls. And I suppose, um, that kind of simple request, that simple question, um, it feels like it needs to elicit a simple answer, which is stop, stop doing it. But that's about as effective as for anybody um, in their 40s, mid 40s plus, um, as effective as um, when Zamo from Grange Hill said, just say no to drugs, didn't kind of work. I struggle so much with this question what do we do and as I think more and more about it I think it's not an easy answer to say what do we do about male violence against women and girls I think you have to dig underneath it and I think we have to ask what about male violence I think that's where it has to start because by understanding why males uh, and violence kind of go together so often. We have to effectively unpick that before we then unpick all the other nuances. When the tragic murder of Sarah Everard hit the headlines, I put a tweet out from my organization 
that said today we were thinking about Sarah, we were thinking about all of the women and girls that are um, victims of domestic violence, that are victims of violence at the hands of men. And we're going to say nothing. We're going to just be quiet for a moment and listen and try to understand because there's a lot of shouting for very, very obvious reasons. I think I'm still listening, is, is if in all honesty, because what I'm still hearing is a lot of noise, a lot of shouting, a lot of what about us. And there's also definitely a place for what about, what about boys and men, what about trans people, what about LGBT people, absolutely. I'm definitely not hearing anybody say, only women and girls. So effectively, we don't need to say what about. I think how we then think about women and girls is also vitally important as a society um, in this unpicking of how do we find, how do we solve this problem? And um, I think, first of all, we have to think about how we think of women and girls in society and positions that they take, um, whether that's in business, but also within society. Maybe telling a boy, oh, stop being a girl, is in some way giving us some indication to how we're thinking about women and girls. And in tackling that, maybe that gives us an indication of, in some way, raising everybody to a level of equalness or equality. I think we've got to understand what the silence is. I think we have to understand why women feel silent and are silenced, um, to, to coin Oprah Winfrey's phrase. I think we've also got to work out why men are quiet bystanders. I think about, well, why am I, why, um, why have I been a quiet bystander? And I guess I've been a quiet bystander at times because I'm scared of violence. I'm scared of, as a victim and survivor of sexual violence, I always have that narrative running through my head in the same way as sometimes I'm a bystander with homophobia. I'm a bystander with racism because I'm scared for my own safety, because I'm scared of male violence. And that takes me right back to this. Maybe we need to understand men's attitudes and Yes, of course, not all men. Nobody's saying all men. But for me, sometimes being a bystander, I think that makes me part of the problem because I'm certainly not then part of the solution. When I say we need to understand the attitudes, this weekend I was um, um, asked to, to give an interview to the Metro News about my experience as a victim of sexual abuse and, and, and rape. And I was looking at the comments and one comment from somebody from a man said, he isn't even good looking enough to have a real man interested in him. I'm glad he was raped. I'm really interested in that. It's trolling, etc. But I'm really interested in what gives that person the ability to, in their mind, make it okay to talk about sexual violence, about violence so flippantly. And that's the problem. That's how we're gonna tackle male violence against women and girls, by looking at the root problem, the flippancy of the subject. Thank you so much for being part of um, um, this discussion to everybody. Thank you to my panel members, it's been, extremely enlightening um, and I now will hand you over to I think Suzanne. Thank you so much Duncan and to all of the speakers you've been absolutely amazing. Um, Luma Day we have got so many. <laughs> I know I know just looking at it oh my god there's so many questions we will try and take as many as possible. Um, what do you think should we should we just go through? I mean, I've seen a very, so a couple of very good general ones, which I think everyone can speak to, and there are some specific ones. So maybe we start with the more general, so we can sort of hear from everyone, and then we can then begin to pick um, selective people based on the question. I think that's a good idea. Sounds good. And we're just gonna, um, while people are then starting to do the Q and A, we're also just gonna put the 
Mentimeter into uh, the general chat so people can see how do you get onto Mentimeter? What's the code uh, that you use to take part in it? Uh, and there'll just be one question there, but back to Illumina Day for the Q&A. Yeah, I think I also want to obviously start off by saying thank you so much to all the speakers. I mean, that was just mind blowing. Um, I was just taking it all in and, you know, one after the other, it was just so good. And, um, you know, furiously also keeping an eye on time, but, you know, I think we've done really well. We might just be five minutes um, out of sync, but I think, you know, with the Q&A, we should really have enough time to really kind of, um, um, address a lot of the questions. There's something I wanted to say, and, and I think it's, I know a lot of the um, speakers did talk about how we shouldn't really, like, we really shouldn't be talking about not all men, you know, and I'm so glad that that came up, because when you talk about male violence against men and girls, the first thing people tend to ask is, well, what about the men? What about male victims? Um, by holding space in this way, we're not saying that the needs and the um, experiences of male victims of domestic of domestic abuse and even violence against me does not matter and i think for me that's something to be said um i can see um i can see um duncan putting his hand up so i'm gonna let him just say something quickly and then i'll, I'll start off from my trade -off. yeah really really quickly i think the problem there the what about is because i think people sometimes miss here so we have a sector the violence against women and girls sector and in that sector and the reports that come out every year it includes boys and men so what government and what people's in positions of power have done is that they've mixed everything up and it really angers me on a personal level i was part of a small group that um developed the cross-government um um, position statement on boys and men affected by um, violence against women and girls or crimes that are described uh, as violence against women and girls and I think I'm very very um, open and clear about this is that violence against women and girls strategy should exactly be that that violence against women and girls that's what we need to research and that's what we need to look at we need something separate to start understanding that impact but because at a government level because at a um a leadership level everything's got mixed up that when we at our levels begin to have societal conversations people then go yeah but what about thanks for that contribution Duncan really insightful um, and one of the things I wanted to say and you might have, if, you, if you're following Karen in Gala's space who obviously has been doing the counting dead women project um, she really tweeted something really interesting and she probably doesn't know I'm going to say this anyway so she's not paid me to say it but I thought it was very interesting she, I think since um, the sad case of um, Sarah Everard, there's been about 16 women that have been, you know, reported uh, murdered. Um, and I think it's about saying that, look, this is not, even after the tragic case of Sarah Everard, it doesn't mean that violence against men and girls and actually homicides have, have ended. And I think that it's worth saying that we didn't have the same public outcry. And I think she, this is what she was trying to make as a point to say, what, you know, where is that public outcry? It should be continuous. It should not be a case of virtual signaling. So we are about real solutions. And I think also part of that also is part of, is, 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 is actually having the right conversations and actually trying to support that with action points. And I think I can say for setting that every single speaker on this panel in there as you heard they're doing something in their own you know in their organizations and in their you know in a collective way to actually try to begin to make that change and to actually speak out so you know i think there's a lot to draw on there but just to say that you know this event is actually quite timely but it's also about saying that this is not just a, it's not going to end as an event we really want to ensure that there is some sort of action points that will follow from the event right so back to the q a now which i'm sure you're all waiting for um, so I'm going to pick the first one from Frank Malane, um, who he said, he said, if you had one week, unlimited money and access to all the change makers, what would you have a go at changing? Okay, shall I just, I'm, I might just start call, calling people now. I'll go with, should I go with um, David Challen first? If you had one week, unlimited money <laughs> and access to all the chain makers what would you have a go at changing i'll just put you on the spot there but i'm sure you can you can definitely right. tackle that question sure right so all the money so what 66 billion isn't it right okay um yeah so i uh, i mean obviously services from that are seeking support 60 percent of women are turned away from uh, women's refugees and that shouldn't be the first port of call to addressing uh, domestic abuse it should be men's violence but at least we should give them the safety that they are seeking and 60 percent of them in the last decade through austerity cuts and 
um, and what have you have not had that space. So obviously be giving them um, the right uh, specialist, uh, sustained, supported, long-term funded uh, um, special support they deserve whilst developing a perpetrator strategy that actually uh, works and confronts the issue. Obviously there's a, a difficulty with uh, navigating what actually does work, but at least some money has been proportioned to that. And if we can um, create an urgency around it with that money, uh not just uh one chunk of money but a sustained chunk of money then we're really addressing the issue with the urgency that it needs uh because uh it's not a, a quick solution but we should be throwing large amounts of sums of money at least give it to give the seriousness to uh what is happening and the scale of violence of of what's going going on for far too long Is it okay to add to that? Is that? Absolutely, Michael, feel free to jump in. Well, just to say something that was um, very fresh, following on from what David said, is was the um, not to have the, well, well we, need to, uh, we need to have a perpetrator register, serial perpetrator register. That was something that, that was very shamefully kind of not done just only just today, I think the day before, that decision is really, uh, really hard to understand. Uh, it, it has real life, uh, urgent kind of impact for a lot of women. Um, if, if we've got these kind of, these funds are kind of fund, 66 billion <laughs> um, mind boggling sums, but the, uh, the training of the judiciary, uh, people involved at every stage of the judiciary from the police right up to the judge in, um, in-depth training in domestic abuse and coercive control in financial abuse uh, so that the people who are making the decisions that ultimately set the tone for our culture are doing so based on the very best expert uh, advice and training and that sadly was some another opportunity missed by the government um, and, and we need to ask some serious questions about that so just to answer Frank's question partly adding to what David said, uh, train the judiciary um, and, oh boy, we're, we're, you know, give, give, give women's refugees the money they need to run properly and stop cutting and cutting and cutting um, because that, that in itself is part of the patriarchal system of abuse. Yeah. Can, can I add Darren, to did you want to say something quickly? And then I'm just going to pass that on to Sam because we've got the next question. But Darren, over to you. Sure. So with all the money in the world, I think I'll be looking at um, how we address um, the worst type of trauma I believe there is, which is relational trauma and how we actually heal from it. So understanding about how the, the intersect, how it affects it how it affects us and how it intersects with the way that we live in every area of our life from our parenting from our um, future relationships with trust um, the way we work with others um, yeah so for me it's how we sort of heal from uh, relational trauma thank you Darren um, it's a great question from Frank um, so I'm going to go on to the next question, and there are quite a few people asking a kind of similar question. So Graham, Douglas, Becky all asked, you know, the, some of the terminology around this conversation, the talk of like toxic masculinity and things that feel very stigmatizing and blaming can be very off-putting. So if we're going to create a space where men and boys can get involved in this conversation in, in this conversation in a really kind of energetic, positive way, how do we do that? There were loads of questions about that. So go to Darshan first and then to yeah. Darren, the others will want to come in as well. When we started being, thanks Suzanne, when we started being mankind, that was literally one of the things in our thing was we didn't want to make anyone feel like we were blaming someone. Um, even though we know there, are, as, as people said, we need to call people out where things are happening, but we felt like we needed to shift this bit and say, look, we're not calling anyone out. We just want to show you things um, and we want you to think about them as you see them and then we want you to talk about them and as you talk about them we want you to develop behaviors that make you see things goes back to the last question you know i answered it earlier there's too many people in government uh, in decision making places who there's an empathy gap they haven't for example someone talked about the stalking thing being voted down well they haven't experienced this they don't realize how serious it is and this goes back to the the whole kind of journey no one wait well not very many people wake up one day and start becoming abusive it starts off 
with little things that all add up. But every point the perpetrator feels like they can get away with it because there is no accountability for that. They it will be like, oh, so you, you didn't let someone, um, you, you asked them where they spent their money. Well, that's not a crime. Um, and it will all add up over time. So the only way for that to happen is for us to tell these stories and start involving people and sort of saying, these are the things that you need to think about so that you don't end up being that person that ever feels that it's right to say to someone, show me your receipt, show me where you spent your money. Um, let me have access to your account, all that kind of stuff. And this is a long-term thing, but that involves a whole thing of like, you know, if we want to sort out government, put, get more women in government. Like we, we, there is no way, if we had more women in government, it would be very different in the House of Commons right now. There would be a lot more balance, but we can't do that overnight. So it has to be a long-term strategy. Um, and then we need to give confidence to, to men who feel like they have to toe the line to say, do you know what, this is how you can talk to your mate and say, yeah, what you're doing is wrong. Um, so you're not calling someone out, but you're having these conversations because we've all know people that have behaved in a certain way and you thought, hmm, alarm bells, but you're like, how do I talk to them? Um, you know, but the thing is, you it, the first thing is to talk to them more because the moment you stay away from talking to someone, you're leaving this wide open gap where they can do whatever they want. And it's the same with mental health. Like if you don't talk to someone, they are in their own space doing their own thing and they're getting more and more confident in whatever that thing is. Um, but when you're connected to someone, it goes back to you know Darren's point about relationships. You learn to build those relationships and it's very hard to behave in a certain way if you've got 10 people that are close to you or influencing you in the positive way, right? So that's the way we do it without attacking anyone without because you're always going to get those on the extreme who are like all men, not all men, not you're always going to get that. But you know what? Forget the extremes, we need to focus on the middle and, and, and work on them and the extremes will then find their way um, over time if they haven't got an audience anymore. But not all men is the easiest hashtag to just throw out there. And uh, it can, it, you know, you've got straight away the press will jump on that and be like, oh, look at that tweet. That's what everyone thinks. Well, it's not what everyone thinks. It's what a few people think. And we have to focus those that aren't on that thing. So it's all about relationships for me. How do we get more resilience around people with stronger relationships, which enable them to think more about themselves and others? Does that make sense? I don't know if it does, but <laughs> yeah. Absolutely does. There's a lot of nodding going on. <laughs> as long as it's nodding the right way. People wanted to, uh, to comment on that one as well. I'll jump in quickly again. I think, yeah, not all men is an absolute. It's just platforming. It's a lightning rod to an extremist kind of behaviour uh, that I don't think a large proportion of people will think before the headline's given to them. Uh, I think it's far more constructive to tackle the people who are open and who, who, who want to do something and don't know how to act and are frustrated about it than uh, tackling whatever right wing press wants to give you know an armchair opinion to anyone sitting there who doesn't have any um really it's a, it's about giving kind of action points and, and uh, what you can do because it's kind of you you're a lot of people are are embarrassed that they haven't really been that they're only now being awoken to the daily experiences of seeing uh you know men's violence on on women you know yeah, you have to open just tiktok nowadays and it's just all over there you know just seeing and i think that's a great thing to come from a platform like that which isn't always usually great but it's, it's giving an insight into a real uh world lived experiences of women that happen daily uh but i think it is really kind of just not addressing that i mean yeah like, completely like dosh said it's a it's the most easiest hashtag and it just doesn't need confronting because I don't think there's a, a, a surge of men there's always a, a greater presence online that sounds uh, larger than the people behind it but there's a lot a uh, larger amount of people who are not saying anything that want to get involved it's about engaging those men thank you so much um if I can joke I'm just mindful of time I think if we just move to each question specifically I don't I can see your hand up but what the next question is actually for you so if you wanted to kind of do both of them together that would be really helpful and then what I would do is pick a question for each speaker and then you can obviously expand on those points as well in the way that you want to um, and just to remind everyone on the call as well that you can also um, share your big idea for what you think needs changing or little idea that you think needs changing by going to Menti um, so it's in the chat function 
journalists just need to go to the website and just put the code in. Um, so feel free to engage with that because that is, you know, we can't see it, but obviously we will, you know, be able to gather that together um, and make sure that your views are also heard. So, so please engage with that. Right. So the next question here, it says, um, any advice, this is for Duncan. Um, Duncan, it says, any advice on overcoming the fear that you've just described um, in terms of, um, in terms of when you when you're feeling like a bystander, especially in a professional setting, how do you learn to challenge and raise this issue when you feel com uncomfortable? Um, just before I answer that, um, just following on from what um, David was saying before, um, I half agree with what David was saying and I half disagree. Um, ignore not all men at your peril and I think if we look at how we've ignored things um, and I don't mean your peril David I mean our peril um, this isn't your responsibility um, uh, l l look at what happened politically how the right has suddenly appeared because I think we ignored them and I say that because yes of course the troll bit get rid of that but I some of my clinical work is working in prisons um, uh, through Survivors Manchester and so many of the people that I work with have committed extreme violence and actually when you get underneath some of that stuff I think I begin to understand a bit better about why they might have started with not all men all lives matter no mask no vaccination etc 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 and I think it's about um, not belonging I do. I think there's something about not belonging. And as someone who I've, I'm sure everybody um, has felt like they've not belonged at some point, it's a really fucking horrible place to be. I think it's an extreme version of not belonging. It's very early in my thinking, but that's where I, I worry about us ignoring something. Um, how do we, uh, to answer the question, uh, I'll be if I know. I mean, I genuinely, I don't know how we stop being bystanders. I try. I try as hard as I can to be that brave person that um, gets up on the tube um, or on the metro, the, the Manchester version of the tube, the metro link, to say to somebody, oh, excuse me, that's not OK what you're saying. I find ways to, and I've found myself in situations where I've moved myself closer to somebody, but then I then begin to think, does that make me look like I'm up to something? Um, I think I think we have to go back to alerting authorities. I think as soon as if I see something happening, I'm pressing a button as a bystander, as somebody that's um, on the train or on the bus. I think we've got to ensure that um, we protect as much as we can, but that also means that we have to protect ourselves. Uh, that's the best answer I can come up with. Thank you so much, Duncan. I'll take the next one and then Suzanne can take the next two. Um, you're going to have to, because there's so many questions, you're going to have to throw through, I'm sorry, to see which one fits which one, but I might put it in the chat so that you can know which, you know, who to direct each question to. But this question, I think, will be good, is probably something that um, David Gad, Professor David Gad, can speak to. Um, it's, it's something about accountability. So someone's asked, oh, what about men being made accountable as a deterrent now? Um, so. I think, yeah, that's the question. There's a lot in there, but I think that's the key question there, so. Well, I think if I read the question right, I suppose we're not in a good place with mm -hmm. this in the UK or in many countries because most perpetrators that I've ever interviewed have been being abusive for quite a long time. You know, when I've interviewed in their, in their 50s and 60s have been abusive since they were sort of 14, 15, 16. And there isn't a great deal of accountability for that. And we have a criminal justice system that routinely suggests to victims that something is going to be done and then almost nothing is done in the vast majority of cases. So maybe it comes back to Frank's question about what you would do if you had that big bounty. I think we need to start being honest with survivors about what the criminal justice system actually can do at the moment. And if it can't do something, ask them what the alternatives might be. And it might be that actually just admission of responsibility from the perpetrator, a willingness to apologize from the perpetrator might be better outcomes to pursue than trying to get people, uh, every person with a conviction uh, through the court. So we've got some challenges there. And I think there are different ways of reconfiguring 
accountability. So having a criminal justice system that is accountable to survivors from a vast range of backgrounds uh, with a vast range of, of life experiences would probably be a better start than trying to just try to immediately fix what we've got now. Because I think the whole thing needs, needs quite a massive overhaul. Thank you so much, David. That's a really good um, answer. Um, so the next question is for Imran, which is say, it says, can, uh, can faith organizations do more? Um, and then once Imran's finished, um, Suzanne, if you want to take the next two questions, thank you. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, in, in our communities, we tend to have these things called community leaders. And for the life of me, I have no idea who these people are, where they come from, <laughs> who put them in power, <laughs> who they represent, I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. Um, I think it, the question speaks to a kind of fractious notion of, of the importance of faith institutions as if as if faith, as if abusers um, give a shit what people in the mosque think or in the religious institution think, excuse my language, sorry. Um, but you know, there, there, there's a general disregard. Having said that, I have, overheard in faith, especially in mosques, generally the faith institutions I visit, um, you know, in the past, when I was younger, people boasting about things that they'd done, but they were always careful to make sure the imam or someone senior in the mosque doesn't hear. Um, could they do a lot to deal with a lot of things in, in society? Hell yes. Um, are they necessarily the best place people, given their influence, Probably not, mm. um, but yeah, they probably should be doing stuff. Um, but you know, other than a Friday, the mosques are empty, so their influence is extremely limited. Mm. Thanks, Imran. Um, and that over to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Aluma Bay. Um, so, a uh, question that's coming up a couple of times for people is whether actually violence against women and girls is the right framing or should we be looking uh, in a more inclusive way about how men and boys get kind of socialized into violence more generally and into controlling behaviors more generally so um is this a conversation that we need to kind of broaden out in terms of the way men and boys are kind of brought into all of those different types of what it is to be masculine what it is to be strong etc and i'm just going to ask a second one at the same time just to sneak it in because i know we're running short of time um which is uh, about earlier interventions so darshan talks a little bit about some of the work that can be done in schools a couple of people have talked about that but is there more that people can see could be done at those very early stages um with boys when they're just starting to form that idea of what it is um, to have an identity, to, to be in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's try and kind of conclude on some really positive, <laughs> inspiring, this is, the, this is the future, this is the boys of the future. Um, so I'll kind of throw that open, but maybe I'll start with Darren. <laughs> sorry, can you just, can you just um, repeat that question for a second, sorry. Sorry, Dan. So the first one was about, is it helpful to separate out men and boys' violence against girls and women from the harm that they do to each other? And then the second bit about kind of how do we reach boys at the earliest stage possible and give them that kind of inspiring view of what they can be for the future, rather than some of the negative things that they might come across in terms of use of violence, use of aggressive behaviours, use of control. Sure. So my, my thoughts are, is we got to call it what it is, right? And um, when we're talking about accountability and stuff, we need to not disassociate. And for me, one of that's one of the issues around disassociating from from an individual or agenda um, is 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 again depersonalizing the issue and again placing it back onto the survivor. Um, you know, God willing, the survivors. Um, so for me, I think we need to make sure that we do keep that. That element in there and in terms of um you know work with younger people and doing that more of that preventative work 
Yeah, 100 percent. It's about having those conversations again. Very often, um, you know, when I've, when, I've, when, I've, when I've sat in capacity of a youth worker and um, young people have been catcalling and yo, yo, what are you saying? What are you saying? And they're getting a negative uh, and the lads are getting a very negative. Um, well, they're getting ignored, quite rightly so, by, by the young ladies. And then they've turned and says, ah, you're a diss anyway, you're a duck. And then having to step into that situation and address that there and then was what we did. But again, I must admit that was easy doing that with young people, right? To try and do that to grown blokes is another is another story. And mm -hmm. I think again, you know, some of my colleagues on the call have made it quite um, open and they've been quite frank and open and honest with you know with all the studies and everything that they've done and their contextualizing on experiences and everything else that it is very much a process to find your voice. So when we're talking about bystander intervention, I'm thinking also about survivors. The fact, the role that survivors, and sorry, the process that survivors have gone through from becoming, um, from being de-silenced and finding their voice, they've gone through a process, right? And we need to facilitate the process so that um, young people can actually, um, you know, redefine some of the, um, the negative notions around masculinity um, and what it means to be a man, what it means to love someone, what it means to take care of someone, um, what it re redefining what you know what um, family may mean to them. Because quite frankly, what they may have gone through um, is you know their early their adverse early childhood experiences is what would have what will be ultimately fe um, feeding, fueling, and informing. Their, their, their current relationships. So it's about how do we provide these counter narratives? How do we hold those spaces to actually let, allow this to actually happen? And um, again, I think it's about, again, these questions. Questions are cool, because it, <laughs> it opens it up really, doesn't it? So I think I'm gonna leave it right there. Thanks, Darren. And I see James's hand went up and then Darshan, and then I'm just gonna say a couple of things before we close, James. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I guess it was just a reflection, really, because you you posed that question of, you know, do we need to talk about um, men's men's violence towards women, or should we be talking about men and men's experience of violence? And I guess my reflection really is we have to be talking about both those things, and the connecting thread is gender and gender norms, right? So it's how norms are uh, put into society, socialized, how they're enforced. Um, so separate, they're not two separate roads that we're going down, they're, they're, they are intertwining and coming back and forth on each other. And so that's the conversation we need to constantly return to, I think. So there's a reason that men, um, we struggle to talk about men as victims and men's fears and worries, because that's not what men should be doing, for example. At the same time, I think it can be hard for men to to hear the reality of male violence, because if you're suddenly being asked to listen to something you're not normally listening to, it can feel like an attack. And it's not an attack. You're leveling the playing field and saying, hang on, you need to attend to this. But because you're normally up there and don't have to look, listen to that, it, it feels like you're being asked to do something different. So I, I guess that's the context for me. I, I, I just wanted to say we have to put it in gender and recognize how that system works. And the final thing I wanted to say, going back to Frank's very first question, um, uh, I'd love to be able to spend lots of money, obviously. But for me, I guess the key thing is it's not just urgency. It's also that it needs to be sustained. And that's the problem we keep having. We have these moments when something happens, often off tragedy, um, and there's this kind of rallying call, and then it's, it's lost. And what it's left to is often very small, unfunded or limited funded organizations to keep doing the work. Um, and that's the wrong way around. We need, we need to sustain that work at a proper level, long term, if we're gonna really make change. Thanks, James. Darshan, and then I'm going to close this out. Um, yeah, I definitely think they should be separated because when you think about um, the survivor, the system is built for men by men. And so the, the fallout of it is very different. Um, yes, they're equally as um, horrible, but the fallout is very different and they need to be dealt with in two separate ways. And so, you know, and that leads to the next bit is I don't 
think that the country truly appreciates the seriousness and urgency of the situation. We're having these conversations, but I, you know, I often say if you went down the road and you said you had 50 houses on the road or 50 flats on the road and you said to everyone, A, do you recognize how serious this is? You, you'd be maybe surprised at how little people think about it. Like the headlines over the last year have been quite a shock to some people. And you're like, how did you not know this? But secondly, if you ask those same 50 people or same 50 households, this goes back to the bystander thing. What do you do to intervene and help? You're probably not going to get um, any confident answers um, because people just don't know. And it goes back to Duncan's point in that thing. You know, it's not just Duncan standing up. Where's the people around Duncan also standing up? How we need to work on society so people start getting ownership of, you know, we need to help everyone. We need to be on the lookout and there should be 10 Duncan standing up, not just Duncan trying to stand up, right? Um, and so there, there is a combination. And, then and if we don't split up this conversation, we're never going to solve this problem. We're never going to try and help people understand how serious it is. And until we do that, we can't create action. Um, and it comes down to that test. Go down your street and ask people how serious they think domestic violence against women is and what they do in a situation where they, where they think it's happening. Nobody has a consistent, credible answer. Thank you so much. And if if the answer to the question is 10 Duncans, I'm in. There we go. That's the money. That's where the Dunk. money's going. Loads That's of Duncans. Give money. Frank the money. I know Frank's work is amazing. Give him the money and do not try and duplicate me. The world does not need that. It's got enough problems. Uh, I want to say a couple of things before we finish because I know we're out of time. Um, thank you. Thank you to the 400 plus people who've been joining kind of in and out as we've gone through the event. A giant thank you to the speakers who've been absolutely brilliant and to my brilliant co-chair, Aluna Day. Um, yes, we will be sending the video, the recording of this session. We will also be trying to break that down into smaller pieces. So if you want to use more shareable material in smaller pieces, you can do that too. We will be sending a transcript to you as well. Um, we will be sending as many details as we can get. That's my cat making an appearance. Um, about all of the speakers, website details, and all of the resources that they use. And we will also be trying to kind of galvanize this into further work. So a lot of people's questions are about what happens next, what happens next. So as Illumina said at the beginning, we weren't trying to kind of get all the way through and answer all these questions tonight and, and kind of finish the conversation. It was just the start. It was just the start. We hope that you'll stick with us, that you'll stick with each other as we carry on having the conversation. I hope you found it like a helpful space this evening, a, a kind of supportive one where people were listened to and kind of were able to hear each other a bit. Thank you for being with us. Um, thank you very much for caring. Um, thank you again to the brilliant speakers, to our BSL interpreters who've kept up amazingly uh, for the last 90 minutes and hope to see you all again soon answering these questions. Thank you. Thank you.